Hey everybody, how's it going? Happy Friday. Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast with me, Harry Simiou. We've got a fair few bits to get into once again today, but I want to start off the podcast by delivering a very, very, very important message. Beware of the pickpockets. They are operating everywhere you go. And in some cases, they're operating having been paid by managers. It's mad, crazy. I'm just kidding. Um, strange story that, wasn't it? Mikel Arteta hiring a load of pickpockets to um, take some belongings from the Arsenal players and then using it as an opportunity to teach them a lesson. Stay alert at all times. Be aware at all times. I mean, I'm certainly going to be more aware when I get on the London Underground today. So uh, maybe Mikel Arteta's taught me a lesson uh, as well on that. <laughs> Let me know your comments uh, on that. Um, is it good? Is it genius? Is it a bit out there? I know that sort of rival fans have taken the opportunity to mock us and him uh, having, uh, you know, carried out that kind of exercise and all the rest of it. It's a bit like the kind of you know, we're playing at Anfield. Let's play You'll Never Walk Alone on the training ground, the light bulb stuff. Mikel Arteta does like to think outside of the box and it does open him up, I guess, to criticism from rival fans. But look, is it a bit out there? Yes. Are they the type of things that I would do? Probably not. But Arsenal are improving year on year under Mikel Arteta. So I guess who are we to be critical of his methods? I guess that's the way um, I'm trying to at least look at it but it is quite funny isn't it um i've seen some of the memes there was um there was a really good meme going around yesterday and you'll remember that kind of famous quote from the amazon doc when he goes when i lose a duel i'm upset yeah that one um terrible Mikel arteta impression i know but there was one going around yesterday and i'm just finding it on my phone um and it was an image of uh, him in that moment i'll just show it to you guys there if you can see it and he says when I lose my wallet, I'm upset. <laughs> Incredible stuff. Incredible stuff. Anyway, on today's show, we're going to talk Eddie and Ketia. We're going to bring you the latest on uh, the negotiations with Marseille. Uh, we're going to talk Mikel Marino again, because despite some uh, reports saying otherwise over the last few days, Fabrizio Romano is still going on about this one. He's still... Uh, reporting that there are talks ongoing, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll try and make sense of exactly what's happening there. And uh, Dominic Solanke is on his way to Tottenham by the looks of things. Now, it's not a Tottenham podcast, obviously, but I just wanted to share some thoughts on that because I know a lot of Arsenal fans at the start of the summer would have been quite happy with Dominic Solanke coming to us. It's not going to happen. He's going to Tottenham. Um, so we'll we'll touch on that very, very briefly as well at the end of the show. But I've, if I could just ask you, if you haven't done so already, leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel uh, if you're brand spanking new. That really, really does help. And if you're listening on any of the audio platforms, please do leave us a review. Right, let's get into our first story. Let's talk Eddie and Ketia. OK, so according to Fabrizio Romano and others, by the way, others have reported this as well uh, in the last uh, sort of 24 hours or so. Uh, understand that Olympic Marseille have sent a new bid for Arsenal's Eddie Enketia. Negotiations will restart and Enketia remains keen on the move. Um, he's attracted by the project at Marseille. Uh, they are happy to return to talks. Uh, this is the French club we're talking about, but they'd only advance at their conditions. Now, I want to have not a rant about this, but I want to have a little bit of a frank conversation around people's expectations of this Eddie and Ketia sale because it's driving me up the wall. Like we're in the last few weeks of the window, okay? And as it stands, there aren't exactly a queue of clubs 
waiting in line to sign Eddie and Ketia. So it's all good sitting there and saying Arsenal need to stick to their guns. Arsenal have their valuation and they need to stick to it. There's no room for movement. If we move, it makes us look weak. If we budge, it makes us look like, um, you know, we're weak in the negotiation department and all the rest of it. I've seen so much of that going around online at the moment. And I just think to myself, guys, be realistic about the situation. We all had a figure in mind of what we'd have liked to get for Eddie and Ketia at the start of the window, okay? My figure in my head was around about £30 million. But that was based on me thinking that Premier League clubs were going to come in for Eddie and Ketia. I've said it throughout the window. If you sell abroad, you have to set a price that is relative to the market that you are selling to. Because if you don't, you are going to price yourself out of a deal. And this is the situation we found ourselves in with Eddie and Ketia. You might want £25 million, £30 million. Marseille don't have that and are not willing to pay that. And as far as I can see, at least at the time of recording today, on Friday, the 9th of August at 10.30 in the morning, there is nobody else with a serious interest that we know of. Therefore, there isn't going to be a bidding war. We need to move Eddie and Ketia on because we need to free up the funds to bring in another attacker. We also need to move Eddie Nketiah on because we need to free up his 100k per week wages that would go towards us further strengthening our squad. But we also need Eddie Nketiah to move on because it's the right thing for him as well. And he's been loyal. He's taken a lot of crap from Arsenal fans. He has stepped in to some really, really difficult situations over the years. He's one of our own. Whatever happened to taking care of our own and our academy graduates, we owe it to Eddie Nketiah to facilitate a move that allows him to go on and continue his career. Now, I'm not saying that we need to be ripped off, and I'm not saying we should accept being ripped off. But I think what Marseille last talked about was around about a package of 25 million euros, which is just over 20 million pounds. That's like 5 million short of what I would expect, right? If I'm saying that the bottom line is 25 million pounds, then we're only a few million out of that. Just do the deal. Like try and squeeze Marseille as hard as you possibly can, of course, and try and maximize um, what you're getting in. We want to put that sell-on clause in there. We've heard all about that as well. Fine. Okay. But this idea that Arsenal should just dig their heels in and completely ignore the fact that A, nobody else is in for him, and B, we're selling to a foreign market, a market in which there is far less cash floating around. Therefore, we have to accept that they are only going to be able to pay within their means. Like this idea that we should, you know, ignore all of that and just go, nope, it's 30 million or nothing is mad to me. Now, if later on in the window, a couple of other clubs come in um, and decide that they are interested in Eddie and Ketia, then perhaps you create a situation where a bidding war can happen. But you've got to be prepared to play a game of chicken and let it run right down to the end. And I feel like that's kind of unfair on Eddie. And I feel like Marseille aren't a million miles away from where we need to be. So if it were me, I would deal. Honestly, at 25 million euros, I would do the deal. Because, you know, there's this idea in, not just in football, but in the world as well, that really frustrates me where people value something in their own head and they go, well, that's what X is worth. I value my car at £20,000. But mate, if nobody's going to pay £20,000, if nobody in the world is willing to pay £20,000, is your car actually worth £20,000? Or is that a number you've made up in your head? If we value Eddie and Ketia at £30 million, but nobody in world football is willing to pay £30 million for him, is he actually worth that? No. That's the guideline price that we've created, but it's market dependent whether or not you get that. And at the moment, the only market we can see to sell Eddie and Ketia into is the French market with Olympic Marseille specifically. And we know that there's a huge disparity in terms of what they have financially and what we have. Um, I'm sure they could go a little bit further than what they're offering at the moment, but they're negotiating too. This is how this stuff works. So, yeah, I just think, you know, obviously for the talks to reopen, it means that the gap is not um, impossible to bridge. But like, I, I, I don't really understand why people think that if we sell him for this price, we are 
you know, cutting our noses off to spite our face. I don't think it has a knock on effect on uh, how we're viewed by other clubs in the transfer window. Um, you know, we've just got really, really good money for Emil Smith Rowe who hasn't kicked the ball for two years. So if there is a market for a player, if someone really wants them, they will come in and they will go that extra mile. Marseille will be well aware, guys, that there isn't a queue of clubs waiting to sign Eddie and Ketia, hence why they're lowballing us, hence why, um, you know, they think that they can get the best deal possible and why they're not in a rush to, to meet our sort of valuation. So there's so many factors at play here, but I just think, let the guy go. 20 million, 21, 22 million is not what I wanted at the start of the window. But as I say, my estimation of what we were going to get for Eddie Nketiah was based on Premier League interest. And at this moment in time, there doesn't appear to be any. So I've got to be realistic. I've got to readjust my expectation. And I think that Marseille currently are just about within that. So I'd do the deal. Call me crazy. Call me stupid. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. But that's what I would do at this stage. OK, we've got to talk uh, Mikel Marino. I'm getting bored of talking about Mikel Marino, to be honest, because for a long, long time, he's looked like he's Arsenal's primary midfield target. We've had reports saying that the deal was imminent, that it would be done in days. We've also had reports over the last few days saying that actually there'd never been any contact officially between Arsenal and Real Sociedad. And I don't know where to, to be on this at the moment. Like, I'm confused um, Fabrizio Romano keeps on doubling down on this stuff. Uh, he put out, this was yesterday, coming up to 9pm, a post in which he said, Arsenal remain in active talks to complete Mikel Marino deal. More steps to follow. So to say that they remain in talks means that in his um view or to his understanding, the talks were already ongoing. He says that Marino has agreed on personal terms with Arsenal. The clubs are working on the deal structure slash payment terms for a fee over 25 million euros. Atletico and Barca, two other clubs that were credited with an interest in the player, have already been formed of Marino's desire to join Arsenal. I want to tell you that I know what's going on. I want to tell you who's right and who's wrong, but the truth is I can't. I don't have a clue. OK, that's the honest answer here. Um, if we end up getting Mikel Marino for a decent price, and I think 25 million euros is a decent price. This is um, being discussed or, or being reported as a fee over 25 million euros. How much over that 25 million euro point? I don't know. Couldn't tell you. Um, so that would be dependent on how good a deal it is as well, of course, for Arsenal. But if you got him for around about 25 million euros, let's say. You're talking 20, 21 million pounds, in which case that's really, really good business. And Arsenal, you know, have identified this player as someone that they like. We heard last week that they were assessing their midfield options, um, which suggested, I guess, that there were other players on their radar as well. I uh, haven't really heard that many names in terms of credible links. So, um, you know, how true that is, we don't really know. The truth is we don't know shit about this, OK? Um, I would like Mikel Marino to come in. I don't think he's an automatic starter. I think he would come in and raise the floor of the squad. We've talked about it loads over the course of the summer so far. So I don't wish to bore you with the same conversation um, over and over again. But for me, like, obviously, Tom Canton and Kaya Kainak earlier in the week reported that, um, or at the back in the last week and earlier this week, said that there'd been no, no talks between the two clubs. Um, and I'm not saying I don't believe them. I just, when I see someone like Fabrizio Romano come out and double down on his original story, someone who's got a really, really good track record, as have the guys, I'm not saying that they don't. It's just, it's hard for me to choose one side or the other. It's hard for me to say, well, Fabrizio's saying it, so it must be true because I know that there's two guys who I've got immense respect for that have reported something different. Now, they were clear in that at the point they were reporting there had been no talks, there had been no talks. Now, things could have changed over the course of the week. So both can be correct, right? Both sources can be correct. But I just feel like I'm being pulled apart on this story and I don't know where to go. I don't know whether to think, OK, Marino's almost in the bag. Now it's about focusing on moving out of forward, Eddie and Ketia, and bringing one in. Or if I'm still worried about the midfield because we haven't got a deal done or close to being done, with regards to that area of the pitch, which for me is the priority area. So I'm a little bit torn. I don't know how to feel about this. 
But Fabrizio Romano is not backing down on this. And it could be that, um, you know, the, the conflicting reports are coming from different sources. And, you know, that could be why the information is slightly different. But as, as I say, it's important to note because, um, you know, I, I've seen sort of some people saying, well, you said it wasn't happening and now it's happening. It's important to note that when it was reported that Arsenal hadn't made contact with Real Sociedad, that was what, a week ago now, just just under a week ago. Things can change. Things can move. Things might have happened over the course of this week that have put us in a position where this is closer now. I like the player. We've talked about it before. Is he an automatic starter for me? No, he's a squad player. He'll be coming in and giving us something that I think we're missing. But I'm also worried about overpaying for Mikel Marino. If it's around about that 25 million mark, I think that's OK. But we're going to have to wait and see what happens on this. We're going to have to sit tight, which is not what you all wanted to hear. Um, but the truth is, guys, I don't know where we're at on this. <laughs> Final story I wanted to touch on today is one involving our North London rivals, Tottenham Hotspur, who are closing in on the signing of uh, Bournemouth's Dominic Solanke. Uh, talks continue between the two clubs uh, with a view to finalising the transfer. The personal terms are in place and the 26-year-old striker is said to be desperate to complete the move from AFC Bournemouth to Arsenal. Bournemouth are going to get a club fee uh, club record fee, I beg your pardon, for him. So it's good business for them. Allows Andoni Iriola to strengthen in other areas. Um, and we know that they're actively trying to do that. So, um, yeah, let's see. Um, let's see how that goes, how that develops. Um, the reason I wanted to touch on it is because I know that there's been a lot of talk about Arsenal bringing in a striker over the course of the summer. And I've said consistently that for me, at the level that we're at, Dominic Solanke doesn't really raise the bar that much. And because he doesn't raise the bar that much, I was very against Arsenal going and breaking the bank to sign him and doing what Tottenham are doing, which it looks like they're going to pay north of 60 million. I think it's around about 65 million, the fee that's rumoured. I, I wouldn't have been an advocate of Arsenal doing that. Like I wouldn't have backed Arsenal in that because I don't think Solanke is at that level. I think with Solanke, there's not that much previous evidence to go by that suggests that he can do it at the highest end of the Premier League. If you think about his time at Liverpool, it, it was OK. And then he got that move to Bournemouth and he's had seasons in the Premier League with Bournemouth where he's produced next to nothing. He's had great seasons in the Championship, but he's also had that one season last season in the Premier League that I think has really skyrocketed his value. The problem is for me is that we've only got that one season to go by. One season for a 26-year-old that says, I am good enough to lead the line and do it week in, week out in the Premier League. Now, that worries me. That concerns me because at this stage in his career, I think you should have two or three seasons of evidence where you can say, OK, this guy is the guy. And I don't think we have that with Dominic Solanke. Tottenham are at a very different stage to us. And so this feels like a decent signing for them. But for those that are online saying, why didn't we go for him? You know, £65 million pound for a centre forward is a steal, particularly at 26 years old. I was never convinced by this. I, it's not like I remember in the past when Spurs made certain signings, sitting back and thinking, ah, I wish we did that. You know, I wish we went for that player. I wish we brought him in. But with this one, I'm sorry, I just don't feel that way. And, you know, that says a lot about, you know, how big I think the gap is between us and Tottenham currently I think Ange Postacoglu um, you know is going to be under a lot more pressure this season because last season Spurs were, were very good in the first half significantly dropped off in the second half got found out a little bit but people were okay with that because you know it was his first season and all the rest of it but now there's going to be a greater expectation and when you go and drop this amount of money on a centre forward as well the expectation levels increase even further do I think he'll be a good signing for Spurs? Yeah, I think he'll be a, a good addition for Spurs where they're at, at their level, et cetera, et cetera. But is he a difference maker in a title challenge? No, I don't think he is. And so I'm absolutely fine with them getting him and us not getting him, um, which I know has been a bit of a conversation over the last few days. Look, if Arsenal wanted Dominic Solanke, um, we've seen that they're willing to pay the money for players that they want. We'd have gone in and made that bid earlier. 
we'd have convinced him that Arsenal is the right place. And I'm certain he would have jumped at the opportunity to join Arsenal. There's a clip going round as well of Dominic Solanke saying he used to follow the Arsenal, went to a few Emirates Cup games, apparently. His first football shirt was an Arsenal shirt. So, yeah, um, this isn't a case of Spurs pip Arsenal to striker or anything like that. Um, and I know that most people aren't portraying it like that, but I have seen a couple of bits and pieces online. This is Spurs making a signing that I think is a good signing for their level. But would it have been a signing that raised the bar for Arsenal? And my view on that is clear. No, it wouldn't. Um, I think he's a good Premier League striker. Do I think he's an elite Premier League striker? No. Um, so that's where I'm at on that. OK, uh, thank you all so much for tuning in on today's episode of the Chronicles of Aguna. Eddie and Ketia, just do the deal, Arsenal. Um, you're digging your heels in. You're trying to squeeze blood out of stone. It ain't coming. Um, Marseille might go a little bit further, but I suggest that we relax our stance a little bit to facilitate a transfer that works for everybody in this situation. Mikel Marino couldn't possibly tell you what's going on with that. Some people say there's been no contact between the two clubs and others are saying that the talks are approaching the final stages. So I just don't know on that. I'm just going to close my eyes and see what happens when it comes to Mikel Marino. Solanke, is he the one for us? Should we have gone for him? Not in my estimations. Um, he's on his way to Tottenham. And um, and I think that's his and their level, uh, to be honest with you. Just uh, a quick reminder once again, uh, beware of the pickpockets wherever you're going today. Uh, make sure you leave a like on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you're brand spanking new. And if you're listening on audio, leave us a review because it really does help. Thank you for listening to the Chronicles of Aguna podcast. And I'll see you all on the next one. Have a great Friday. Goodbye. 